<coughs> Good evening and salam alaikum. Thank you very much, Tansri, for that uh, and for the invitation extended to come here. I have, of course, known Tansri for quite a number of years uh, in her role as the chairman of the Securities Commission of Malaysia, and she has invited me a couple of times there to present at their sessions. So she's not new, but I don't know. Whether knowingly or unknowingly, she has chosen a subject which could form the content for a whole module of 12 <laughs> lectures rather than one lecture. So I have to try to squeeze it in within the time we have. Uh, we will try our best. <coughs> so what I want to do is to start very briefly with the <coughs> evolution of Muslim commerce. Then look at what we call the nominate contracts or the contracts which were received from the early days of Islam and then see how these contracts can be used <coughs> to create products and how these products can form an Islamic bank and finally try to see if all this effort takes us anywhere near the maqasid or the objectives of the Sharia or not if not then the whole exercise is in vain. If yes, then fair and well. If maybe, then we say what needs to be done to take us there. So, but those will be subjects of later discussions, I hope. But I'll just give you a hint on that. So, what we want to do here is to divide our discussion on the evolution of Muslim commerce in three phases. The first phase is from the sort of advent of Islam, 670 to about 1500 AD. Now, the main feature of this period is that within a very short space of time, Islam spread across a very wide area. So if you look at, like, say, 711, Muslims had already crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and were in Spain, <coughs> south of Spain. Same time, they were touching on the shores of China. And as you know from the prophetic hadith, which uh, says that go to China to seek ilm if you have to, to seek knowledge if you have to, which means that the idea of China was well known in that society. <coughs> they had reached there. Now, the important thing about this spread is that at that time, we don't know much about what was happening in the American continents. As far as these, from Europe to Asia was concerned, these were the <coughs> complete areas of the Silk Route, which was the main trading artery for the known world from here. And that was obviously where we used to get the silk and spices and whatever from the East. Now, the thing is that if you <coughs> control the main trading route or trading artery, clearly you would control the instruments of trade. Because clearly you could dictate how people will trade with you. And this lasted for 700 years. And we will see how we could control the instruments of trade and why this is the critical period in which concepts of Islamic <coughs> finance developed. And in fact, Islam is one of the few religions which has primarily spread as a commerce-driven empire. <coughs> Very little of it is spread by conquest. Mostly it is commerce-driven. And it was, of course, fortunate that the Roman and Persian empires were on the point of decay and just gave way to the advance of the Muslims. 1500 or 1492 AD, to be specific, marks the date when Muslims were finally expelled from Andalusia <coughs> with the Inquisition. It also marks the date when Columbus came to <coughs> King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain and said, if you fund me, I want to discover an alternative route to the East and challenge the Muslim monopoly of this trade route. They did fund, and Columbus, of course, as we know, found the wrong place, but was very soon succeeded by other explorers like Magellan, 
or um, uh, you know Vasco da Gama and so on, who <coughs> did round the Cape of Good Hope and reached India and China. Now, once you discover a sea route to the riches of the East, it is much more efficient than the land route, much more cost effective, and poses a major challenge to the monopoly of trade. And we will see what happened to the Muslims in that time. It's only after decolonization started that 1950 onwards, Muslims started to think again of what to do. And this is where we situate the rebirth of the contemporary Islamic banking and finance model. Each of these phases has a formative influence on how Muslims have started to think about not only commerce, but on every kind of issue. And it's very important that this middle gap of, again, 700 years was the time when, because of the challenge from an alternative route, and then, of course, companies like the East India Company, Dutch East India Company, and followed by colonization, put Muslims into a seriously defensive mode. And they cut off from developments in Europe. Europe went on to develop other things, which we will see. So just keep that framework in mind. Now, <clears throat> the first phase, of course, was the rapid <coughs> expansion of and domination of the Silk Route. And at that time, because it was a commerce-driven empire, contracts were developed to service this. One of the key features in the Quran, and this is probably the first time that a text, sacred text, is talking about the sanctity of contracts and the importance of having written, witnessed contracts. In fact, one of the injunctions is that if somebody asks you to witness a contract, it is your duty to agree to witness it, because not many people could write at that time. So sanctity of contract, which could then be taken to courts in case of dispute, became primary. And this is where contracts were developed, the initial contracts, which we will see which were those, right? Secondly, some of the contracts required <coughs> profit sharing, complex profit sharing ratios and so on. Clearly, this in its turn required accurate record keeping. Because without that, you would not be able to determine how to execute those contracts. And anybody who has tried to multiply in <coughs> Roman numerals will understand that it's not an easy job. So the discovery, the formulation of the Arabic numerals, which is what we use now, was absolutely vital to development of bookkeeping and record keeping with the sanctity of contract. This provided, if you like, the engine for commerce. <coughs> and just to show you what can be done, just look at this coin. <coughs> we call this the offer coin. This is a coin minted in the reign of King Offa of Spain, <laughs> uh, sorry, of North England <coughs> in 840 AD. On the one side, it has the emblem of the king, Offa Rex. Just now, it's just like you would have Queen Elizabeth Rex on the coin here at the moment. But on the other side, there is an attestation of Muslim faith in Arabic. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. This is a very strange discovery. And this coin has been discovered in Sweden, and now it is in the British Museum. Sweden, of course, the Vikings must have plundered here and taken it there. So we found it there, which is fine. <coughs> the question is, does that show that the, queen ha the king had become Muslim? There is no known record of any Muslim in North England, in Mercia, in 840. So clearly we have to look for alternative explanations. One of the explanations which looks very plausible and also probably is correct, is that the king must have sent traders to Andalusia, south of Spain, and said, we want to trade with you. 
And those people would have said, okay, fine, what are you going to pay us with? And they might have come up with their couple queries and things like that and said, look, this is useless to us. We cannot do anything with this. Let us jointly design a coin which will be valid across the Silk Route up to China, recognized as an authentic coin. <coughs> and so they have come up with this <coughs> dual-faced coin, which is satisfactory to the king and serves the purpose of it being a negotiable currency across the route. Now, this shows you that clearly, if you control the route, you control the instruments. It was only one step from there, you say, if you want to trade with us, you have to deal with us in Musharaka or Mudaraba or whatever other contract we have. We don't know any other bits and pieces. What you have, you keep it yourself. So that was a time when things could be done. Secondly, because of the vast growth <coughs> and f fast growth of Islam, there was a need to codify law to educate new embrace, people who had newly embraced Islam as to how to practice the faith and so on. So we had the development of the schools of law. And today we have four or five schools, which everybody knows, the main Sunni schools, Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, and Shafi, and then the Shi'i schools, Ismaili, Jafari, Zaid, and <coughs> others, and then the Ibadi school. So this has an impact on finance. <coughs> Let me explain to you how. If you look at this map, <coughs> and just look at the blue areas, these blue areas are predominantly Shafi, followers of Imam Shafi. And there is a little bit here in South India which are also followers of Imam Shafi. The key feature of all these blue areas is that all of them are near the sea. Their livelihood depends on the sea. We are not aware, for example, that Indonesia, which is here, is composed of 15,000 islands. So it's really sea-based. <coughs> now, we come to a simple matter of what kind of seafood you can eat, or a Muslim can eat. Uh, let me tell you a small anecdote. I was at the dinner for hosted by the Central Bank of Malaysia, and I was seated at the table with six Hanafi scholars. The Central Bank of Malaysia, in its own wisdom, and of course in honor of its guests, had tried to host the best food possible. So we get the first course, and the first course is shark fin soup. Hanafi scholars just say, we cannot eat this. <laughs> Next course, seafood platter. So you have lobsters, and so it was a full seafood. And these Hanafi scholars completely went hungry all the way. <laughs> and I said, why can't you eat it? What's wrong with you? They said, we can only eat fish with scales. Anything else we cannot eat from the sea. I said, is it Quranic? They said, of course. I said, where? So they said, OK, it says, eat anything wholesome from the sea. That's all the Quran says. There's nothing more. So I said, this is now interpretation what you consider wholesome. If you're living near the sea, anything which moves in the sea is wholesome for you. <laughs> if you don't need fish or seafood, then you can start to be choosy. And of course, in Baghdad of that time, where the Hanafi school was based, the custom and the law and the, if you like, urf was Jewish law. <coughs> Jewish law up to today only eats fish with scales. No prawns, no lobsters, no crabs, nothing. So clearly there must be some wisdom behind that and then people living around say this is what is meant by wholesome from the sea and we take it. Shafi law says no. Now how does that, so you can see how differences can develop from the same <coughs> text. In a very similar way <coughs> We have 
differences between the schools on issues like what is meant by gara or uncertainty, what is the status of any promise in Islamic law, and can you trade in things like debt instruments? <coughs> now, as you will know, these are the critical elements <coughs> of how you build products. Now, let's take just the question of promise. Is a promise binding? So if I promise somebody, I don't act, don't act upon it later, can that somebody take me to court and sue me? Straightforward, Hanafi law says no, promise is not binding. Maliki law says it is absolutely binding because it has the danger of revealing a Muslim not keeping his promise or her promise. And this is detrimental to the faith. Therefore, once you promise, you have to execute it. <coughs> Shafi law says that it is only binding if you have suffered a loss as a result of the promise. So see, now there are variations. Now, in present day Islamic <coughs> finance, the idea of wad or promise is used where a contract cannot be used because of the presence of uncertainty. And if you cannot make it binding, then the whole thing falls flat. So, those differences which emerged at that time are also <coughs> still there, critically influencing the kind of products and structures you can do in different jurisdictions. Right. So, at that time, about six key contracts were in existence and developed further. The first one is called the Mudaraba, which is a risk-sharing venture capital. This, in fact, is quite common, and in fact, the profits on mode of operation to take a uh, you know, parcel of goods <coughs> funded by different parties, take it on a caravan trip up to Damascus, sell it, come back and distribute the gains, is what is called a mudaraba or a venture capital contract. Whatever gain you distribute in proportion you agree before going. The key feature of this contract is that all the risks are with the capital provider. If there is a loss, the expertise or service provider has no liability apart from his or her time and effort. So this is quite a risky and it is a trust based <coughs> contract. And this is where after experience the Prophet came to be known as the trustworthy person, Al Amin. I mean, imagine if I ask you to put money into, <coughs> into a parcel and I take it and come back after two months and say, sorry, folks, I lost everything. What would you do to me? Would you say, thank you very much, we believe you? Or you say, this guy is kindness. So it is a trust-based contract which needs a very <coughs> different operational structure behind it. But this, has, this was common. And the risk <coughs> was adjusted by adjusting the profit share on the next contract. If you had a very good profit, you would get a lesser profit share. If you had a loss, you would get a higher profit share next time. And so the risk was adjusted in that way. The next contract, which is quite common everywhere, is a straightforward partnership where you put joint capital and you share profit and loss. There's no magic about it. The third one, which is more and more common now, is the Mudaraba contract, which is a markup sale. So it's a financing contract for asset purchase. <coughs> kind of yeah? Or you could have a leasing contract, which is an ijara for the use of the user front of an asset. It's just straightforward, and you have a rental payment on it. Now, all these contracts for assume the existence of the contract, uh, the uh, substance of the contract to be there tangible. <coughs> but when you come to istisna, which is a production or construction type of contract, you are financing a construction or production activity. 
the asset is not in existence, it will come into existence. But this was practiced and so it is allowed. Or if you come to a solemn contract which is similar to istisna but for an agricultural situation where you would fund a crop for its planting to harvest and you will then <coughs> get your payment back upon harvest. So these two do not have the asset in existence at the inception. But this were possible. So these are what we call nominate contracts. Now, they have assumed a kind of sanctity around them, although there is no reason why they should be sacred. <coughs> but these were practiced at that time, and lots of uh, conditionals, uh, case material, adjudications have been developed on these contracts. So <coughs> scholars always prefer to go back to this and build products based on these contracts. Okay. The second phase, after those contracts were developed and so on, <coughs> was obviously the discovery of the alternative route and uh, the rise of the West. Slowly the beginning of the Enlightenment and the, and the beginning of awakening in Europe from its own dark age. <coughs> in this period, a number of things developed in Europe which Muslims were not participating in because they had shut down now the barriers. They had gone into a defensive mode because they were being challenged. <coughs> so before, they were ready to accept and capture anything new. That's how it spread. Now, everything outside became bidda or innovation or to be shut. <coughs> Say, no, 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 this will make trouble for us. In that period, Europe developed two or three things which we need to understand to make sense of what Islamic finance is all about. First, with fits and start, they built what is known as a modern bank, mobilizing savings <coughs> to invest. Okay, it came up in a very <coughs> strange way. It was mostly traders in Florence and Italy generally, which was a very key trading post, who because of their reputation, lots of people used to leave lots of wealth with them for safekeeping. And these guys start to realize that, look, if we lend out some of these wealth, we could make money on it because nobody's going to ask for everything back in one go. So they started to lend out uh, <coughs> more and more of it. Sometimes they overdid it and they collapsed <coughs> and there was a run on the house. But otherwise, they made money. And they had to clear it because clearly this was usury. So they went to the Pope and negotiated a percentage for expiation so that they cleared that as well. And it went on. But gradually, it developed into a banking system with a central bank, which obviously started off as a lender of last resort. So if you overstretched yourself, there was somebody who could guarantee <coughs> your solvency and therefore keep that. And so the banking system developed. Before, in Muslim commerce times, there was no banking system. If you wanted a loan, you go to people and ask for a Qazul Hassan, which was a strictly small scale loan. If you wanted to invest, you invest in one of those modalities, not through a bank. Here now, we got the development of banks where savers and borrowers or investors came for the same for the, to the same person or to the same intermediary. Yeah, that is why banking is called financial intermediation, the intermediate between savers and borrowers. <coughs> In that situation, obviously, credit began to assume a much more positive connotation. Before, credit or debt was frowned upon. Now, slowly, debt became neutral and then good. And now, impossible to live without debt. So it's, it's traveled a long way, which poses challenges for systems which do not recognize debt. The other thing which developed was what we call a joint stock company or a limited liability company. These were companies <coughs> formed 
to fund the voyages of the ships and trading voyages. So for example, the East India Company was a joint stock company with limited liability formed by shareholders who profited from the riches of the East. Okay? These two things drove the expansion and domination <coughs> of global trade by Europe in the 400 years, right? So now you imagine a situation <coughs> where Muslims have gone into a defensive mode. The whole <coughs> business of controlling the Silk Route is gone. Instruments of trade, alternative <coughs> instruments of trade have been developed. And you're beginning to think now what to do. <coughs> so you first say, OK, as everywhere you say, okay, although this is not Islamic, but it is necessary, so let's do a bit of this. So this is the argument of Zarura, which started to be put around 1800s and so on. <coughs> or, alternatively, you can go on the argument of Maslaha, public interest, that it is in the public interest to do this, although it's not strictly Islamic, <coughs> but we have no choice. Let's do it. And you can read uh, these kind of arguments in the writings of people like Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, Jamal bin Afghani, and so on, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, where they have this uh, proposition that we have, this is now maslaha and imperative for us to do because our law is much more behind. And of course, this was followed by the independence struggle following the two world wars. Now you have a free country, a free hand supposedly, to do what you want to do. And you're at a loss what to do now. <coughs> so here, <coughs> after a period, we had a first conference of economists in Makkah in 1976. I was a young economist like you at that time. And was fortunate enough to be invited to that conference. And the argument, and what shall we do now? A lot of us, a lot of them at that time, realized that really there were major things in the economy to be changed before you could talk about banking and so on. <coughs> but a lot of them realized that those were political questions. To ask governments to do this or that or so on that is not going to be welcomed as a starting point. So let us start with something small which can act as a catalyst towards that. And so it was decided to see if we could launch a number of Islamic banks. And as uh, my friend uh, Iqbal Khan outlined last time, fortunately this was also a time when we had the first burst of liquidity from the increase in oil prices. So a number of parties were willing to put their money where their mouth was and form Islamic banks. So the Faisal Islamic Bank and Baraka Bank and Dubai Islamic Bank and so on were formed. Now the challenge became how to operationalize those 500 year old nominate contracts. They were designed for a different time, different situation, different circumstance. And secondly, <laughs> if you want to form a bank, you want to be, or you have to be within banking regulations. Banking doesn't like risk sharing contracts, partnership contracts. It likes fixed debt lending. Can you imagine you go to your bank and say, can we make a partnership? I want to say this is not my job. Investment banks, maybe, because they are not within the banking regulation. And this is one of the things which uh, our brother Iqbal Khan was hinting last week that one of the turns which we took was go to banking rather than asset management <coughs> or investment banking. And that's something debatable whether that was the right thing to do, but that's where we were. Now we have to fit banking and limited liability into our nominate contracts. 
And of course, banking is based on interest, primarily. That is how they operate. Uh, until some time ago, not now. Now it's even worse. But before, the intermediation margin was the interest you paid your depositor and the interest you charged your borrower. So that was the difference between the two. That was what you made the profits on. However, for fitting our contracts into banking, we engaged in a sophisticated exercise of reverse engineering to see how each of the contracts or each of the requirements of current day customer could be met through an Islamic contract. And this is the primary task which has been going on for 40 years. We have managed to replicate each and every contract. And we want to see how successfully we have done. And in that period, a number of key principles have been adhered to. One is that there is a need for backing by tangible assets. So if there is no tangible asset, that contract will become difficult to execute in Sharia. There is obviously the prohibition of riba or usury. <coughs> and there is a preference for risk to be shared amongst participants. And there is limitation on sale of financial assets and their use as collateral, which means sale of debt. And of course, sale of debt at anything other than par. If you can't sell it at anything other than par, then there is no point in selling debt. And of course, prohibition of finance for activities deemed to be incompatible with Sharia law. So this is like <coughs> alcohol, gambling, conventional financial services, and tobacco. If you are financing those, those contracts will be void and no in Sharia. So in, with that in mind, there are four categories of contracts which we need. Yeah? First, if you have spot delivery and spot payment, so you take your money, you buy something <coughs> to get the goods. No Sharia, nothing involved, unless those goods are non permissible. Other than that, it's fine. But uh, of course, uh, unfortunately, not everything we want to buy, we have the money to buy. So. You want delivery now and pay later. So spot delivery, deferred payment. <laughs> you can do that through a murabaha contract, which is cost plus, which you say <coughs> installment financing. Or you can do that through an ijar. You can start using something and pay a rent about it. Spot payment and deferred delivery. So you want payment now, but you get delivery later. As I said, Salam and Istisna will allow you to do that for either construction finance or agricultural finance or so on. Now, when it comes to deferred payment and deferred delivery, that's where it becomes challenging, because that is what we call derivatives. There is neither the goods nor the money now. Everything is in the future. So you have futures and options and whatever you have derivatives. That is where Sharia scholars are still grappling. These three can, can be solved. Let's see. So if you look at transactions, <coughs> you have a number of <laughs> transactions. So you have transactional contracts, which don't need anybody else. If you have the money, you go to a shop, you buy the goods, and you get home. So this is just a proper, pure transaction. Or if you want to change your money, say, from pounds to dollars, <laughs> you go to a saraf, and he changes it, or she changes it, and there is no problem. As I said, this is, uh, we are not all fortunate to have that. So we need a financing contract. Sometimes we need somebody to finance. <coughs> and the trader may finance themselves. So you go to a shop and say, OK, we will finance it. You can pay us over a year if you pay so much. Right? You don't need a bank or anything. The trader will finance. It's only when you need a intermediary, a bank or something to finance, then you can go to an intermediary. So you can have contracts, <coughs> including Islamic contracts, worked through this structure and fulfill most of the needs which you have. And this is just a little bit of a detailed take on the kind of transactional contracts. So, so sale of ownership, or sale of right to use, and then down whether you have uh, uh, immediate <coughs> sale or finance sale, or intermediation contracts. Now, 
The key feature of these contracts, as far as Islamic finance is concerned, is that all transactions are sale rather than financing. Sharia contracts do not recognize <coughs> financing. And this creates problems. For example, if you have a Murabaha contract, although it may look like a financing contract, it's you are financing an asset, because it is a sale, if you break the contract, you are liable for the full amount of the sale price. So, for example, if you take a five-year installment contract <coughs> and agree to pay, say, 200 pounds over the 1,000 pound price because of that, if you break it after one year, you are liable for the 1,200 pounds, not the proportion. And this has caused problems in many jurisdictions where people have used these contracts for long term, but they are not designed say for housing finance and so on. Then the second principle is that there is no time value of money there. So there is no interest payment. You have a murabaha, yes, but it is risk based. There is no, it's not based on the time. It is still a sale contract. And you have the importance of form as much as substance. It's not only substance. Sometimes <coughs> form overrules substance in contracts in Islamic finance. And all these three presents challenges to us. Okay. <clears throat> Murabaha, of course, is a markup sale, as I said. And Murabaha to purchase order. See, original Murabaha was somebody who wants to sell an <coughs> asset and agrees to finance you. Now you go to a bank to say, I want to buy this asset. You buy it and bring it and sell me. So it's a slight modification of the original. And scholars are not agreed that this is possible. Most of them are agreed that it's possible because that's what's happening. The main problem with this <laughs> is that it is and has become the most commonly used contract in Islamic banks because it is closest to a debt contract in its substance. In substance, you are financing an asset over a period of time. <coughs> and so if you look at S balance sheets of Islamic banks, 80%, up to 80% could be Murabaha contracts in one way or another. And there are other forms of Murabaha which we will see which make it even more complicated. So this is a, what we call a reverse Murabha. And this is where the challenge comes. Yeah? Essentially, you want a credit facility. <coughs> I want 100 pounds or 100 dollars now to pay you back in a year's time. In a normal conventional finance, you go to the bank and say, can I have a loan for 100 pounds? I pay you with interest in a year's time. Islamic finance, you can't do that. So you resort to a mechanism which is quite ingenious but at the same time not intellectually satisfactory. Right? You have a supplier, you have a bank. The bank buys, say, $100 worth of a commodity from supplier A and sells the same thing to the customer for 110 <coughs> to be paid back over a year. The customer sells it to supplier B for 100 because that's the price of the commodity. So if you look at it at the end of the day, the customer ends up with 100 pound, 100 dollars, and the bank has given 100 dollars to the customer repayable over a year with 10 percent on top. So you have created a financing facility by using two sales. Each of the sales is valid in Sharia law. And the combination of two sales then becomes valid. So this is a very common <coughs> cash financing facility, either projects, individuals, whatever. And this is becoming bigger and bigger part. The problematic thing about this is that you don't care what the asset is could be anything because you don't want to hold it for more than a second. And this is where kinds of challenges are emerging. Or you come to a home financing product where you want to finance a home. 
conventionally in a mortgage, you take a 25-year mortgage and you pay monthly. Whatever you pay is divided into two portions. One is your interest payment and the other one is your capital payment. Initially, obviously, the capital payment is small. But as your loan becomes smaller, the interest payments become smaller and capital payment becomes higher. So over 25 years, your loan is extinguished. This is a conventional model. In an Islamic finance, uh, home, uh, Islamic finance, home finance per uh, product, you can't do that because this is clearly a loan contract. So what you do is that you can buy the house jointly with the bank and own it jointly. And as you pay, part of the capital, your ownership increases. Therefore, the rental payment, your share of the rental payment goes down. Very similar to a conventional mortgage, you can replicate it quite easily. Now the question is, in a loan contract, if you default, <coughs> the bank obviously repossesses the property and comes after the other assets. Because the bank has not lent you for the property. It has lent you money with the property as collateral. So you're still liable and you will see many people being pursued after they have defaulted or whatever. In a similar fashion, if the property increases in value, the bank has no right to that value because it is not the property. It is the loan. The bank is interested in the value of the loan. However, in a shared ownership, this equation cannot hold. If there is a loss, the bank has to bear its part of the loss. And if there is a gain, the bank is entitled to its part of the gain. So in a symmetric contract, if it was constructed like that, that would be a very different contract to what we have on the high street here. Islamic banks, in order to have a level playing field, have designed a home finance product which behaves exactly like the uh, conventional repayment mortgage product with no sharing of losses and no sharing of gains. If the bank doesn't want to share, uh, if the bank doesn't want its part of the gain, it is entitled to do that. If I am the recipient of a gain and I say I don't want it, that is perfectly valid in law. Nobody can discourage me from doing that, right? But if I am saying I am going to take, make you bear my part of the loss, that is an imposition. That cannot happen. But they have found ways around to do that. And we have had other challenges here, of course. Like, how do you <laughs> calculate the rental value? Does it mean that a property in Oxford will be more expensive or rental will be more than the same property, say about 50 miles from here, then if you are lending or financing, <coughs> you have a challenge on calculate. So they have resorted to using LIBOR as a benchmark, which again compromises the objective of what you want to do. And there are stamp duty <coughs> issues and so on, which we do not need to go there. We understand that the existing mortgage product was primarily responsible for the subprime crisis, which was then responsible for the whole financial crisis in the United States. And there are now studies coming out saying that if we had a risk-sharing product, we wouldn't have the subprime crisis because there will be a stability in the system itself. That, again, is a discussion for some other time. But there is value in that. But at the moment, Islamic banks are not executing that product as it should be. However, there are other areas which need to be looked at. So if you had cash or if you have assets, you need to allocate it across a range of asset classes yeah, to balance your portfolio. So you have cash, you have equity, of course, uh, <coughs> stocks. You have bonds, you have property, alternative assets, commodities, hedge funds, derivatives. If you want to have a level playing field, you need Islamic and conventional finance to be able to invest in all those assets and derive similar returns. Otherwise, you will be at a disadvantage or advantage. So let us see. <coughs> 
the key gap in the asset classes is the bond class. Because by definition, a bond is an interest-bearing <coughs> instrument. And so you cannot have it. But now, the last 10, 15 years, we have the development of what are called sukuks, which behave very much like bonds. Although, there are lots of challenges in devising sukuk satisfactorily to Islamic law and issues of uh, sale and so on. But IOFI defines 14 types of sukuks you can have. And key feature, <coughs> ownership rights to asset. Because that's what Islamic finance is about, ownership rights to an asset. Now here, <coughs> we have an idea of what is ownership. Again, it will differ from different jurisdictions and different uh, fix, different schools of thought. Is beneficial rights to an asset's income enough for ownership or is title transfer needed? And they will create huge <laughs> issues. But no problem. At the moment, Sukuks last year, $132 billion of Sukuks were issued. About half were bought by conventional <coughs> debt managers, another half by Muslim uh, banks and institutions. So it seems to be appealing to both uh, parties. Uh, we don't need to go there too much at the moment. What about uh, stocks? Yes, investment in stocks can take place. Sophisticated rules have been developed for screening stocks, very much like <coughs> ethical screening, where certain groups of industries are not uh, valid for investment, like alcohol, tobacco, gambling, and so on. Other stocks which have uh, revenues which are not uh, permissible are also not allowed to be invested. <coughs> but if you invest in a proper screen portfolio, you can see that the red line here, for example, is the Sharia index, which is doing better than all the other indices, right? And this is from September 3 to September 12, so across a couple of stock market cycles. It's clear that stock investments equity investments can meet the challenge of delivering a proper return if you wanted to. And it seems that leverage or debt really uh, and the discouragement of debt is what's giving the return there. Okay? Now, if you put those contracts together, you form a bank, an Islamic bank. This is, as I said, a new novel feature which was not there in the original times. This is a very, very problematic structure in jurisprudence. Because if you look at this way, the bank becomes the operator. And the provider of funds becomes what we call the Rabbul Mal, or the risk-bearing part. If you look at the other way, now the bank becomes the Rabbul Mal, the capital bearing party and the other parties become the you know expertise providers so the risk of this bank is very different from the risk of another bank which doesn't operate like that it just takes deposits and makes lendings yeah here each of these contracts has got a different risk feature so we need to then engage in risk analysis and see how this will behave, <laughs> whether they could match their assets with their liabilities and so on, what other instruments we need to make them work. We're just beginning in reasonably sophisticated jurisdictions like Malaysia to get in a situation where we could manage some of these risks effectively. Otherwise, you're left with holding too much cash and therefore a drain on your profitability. All right, so you can see also that an Islamic bank is a mixture <laughs> of commercial banking and investment banking. Commercial banking, of course, you take deposits and you lend on 
sort of murabaha type contract. <coughs> but as soon as you come to risk sharing contracts, you enter what is investment banking territory because you are now sharing the risk. So to regulate that as one bank, regulators are finding it difficult. They can't. So you have to go outside the banking parameters if you want to operate this model or limit your remit to what is regulatable. Okay, so now we come to the last slide quickly. We can see that with all the <coughs> effort of 40 years, we have made the nominate contracts, played with them, sliced and diced them <coughs> to make contracts which are Sharia compliant and acceptable to regulators through reverse engineering. The question is, does this provide any additional benefits which we are looking for? Like, does it provide more equity, <coughs> more justice, or not? If not, why are we doing it? This is a question which is out there. Lots of students are researching. Every time a student comes and says, sir, I want to do this. I say, fine, do it. And then they're going to say, oh, it's very difficult. I say, okay, just do it. Because <laughs> that's what, <laughs> if you want to do it and satisfy yourself, it's not easy. And the question is still out there. But the basics have been laid. Now it is a question of modifying it to do more. But there are other issues which can be looked at. For example, if you look at the establishment of uh, the Tabung Haji or the Pilgrims Fund in Malaysia. This was established before any Islamic bank was in existence. <coughs> Pure and simple, it was the brainchild of uh, Professor Enko Aziz, who is the father of the present uh, central bank governor, as Iqbal Khak said. He wrote a paper for the Prime Minister to say that, look, at the moment the key purpose of saving for any Malay Muslim is to save enough to perform the pilgrimage. Now this could take a number <laughs> of years or whatever. If we were able to mobilize those savings and invest them in, for example, providing better infrastructure for their farming or in other things, the returns put back into the fund will make them go to Hajj sooner. And his estimate was about <coughs> eight years. It will save eight years to their effort. So they could go much younger than older. In fact, uh, the first batch <coughs> were able to go 12 years sooner. So it was much better than thought. Now that is a product which grows out of a need Clearly, because it's a pilgrim fund, you can't invest now in things which are not permissible. So they had to find a way to invest it which was acceptable in Sharia, right? So Tawam Haji became one of the pioneers. And when Bank Islam was formed in the early 80s in Malaysia, on day one, <coughs> they had, if I'm not mistaken, 2.3 million customers. Because all those customers became customers. I would love to open a bank with 2.3 million customers on day one, right? <laughs> My job is done. But you have those opportunities which then lead you to saying that it fulfills an objective in society and delivers a banking model. And those more of these things are needed. The second challenge is this question of, we can say everything <coughs> is halal or compliant or permissible, but Allah in the Quran several times mentions halal and tayyib, permissible and wholesome. Why does he mention something else? So I always explain to my students in this way that can you become obese on halal junk food? <laughs> Clearly you can. Each of those units may be financed properly, sourced properly, and the chicken is halal or the meat is halal and the capital is halal and everything, but still everybody eating the same thing may become obese, which does not serve the purpose. So we have to find a yardstick to say that, look, this is not fine. Somewhere we have to draw the line that this is not where we are going. Or if you go into things like sustainability, 
clearly short term profits can be obtained by extractive activities like illegal logging or you know extraction industries without thinking of what will happen in the future to the environment once you factor the environment in then your investment horizon has to lengthen it can't now your payback periods are not 3 to 5 years they become longer because those activities take longer how do we use the sharia or islamic finance to deliver those objectives which are at the bottom of what we want to do these are the challenges of the times yet to come and for you and me i am about to retire so those are for you thank you very much